My name is Christy Vallier, and I'm an assistant professor of architecture and the chair of this semester's Knowlton School Balmer Lecture Series entitled Mingle. Before I dive in, I would like to invite you all to the reception following this evening's lecture. <clears throat> and on behalf of Kimberly Wilzak, a PhD student in dance, I would like to invite you to a performance that begins at 7.30 in front of Knowlton entitled Oculus Pile. The duration of this piece is eight minutes, and I understand that it is a piece that studies the performance of designed pedestrian movement. So, a lot going on here this evening. Back to mingling. To mingle is to shift states. It implies the ability to equally join and disconnect. It is a deliberate drift, an active movement that prioritizes overlap over blending, bleeding, and blurring. In the realm of design and planning, a mingler maintains distinct qualities while seeking productive alternatives. And I think alternatives is a good place to begin as I introduce this evening's lecturer, David Eskenazi. David is an architect and designer that aims to occupy a territory that seeks innovative, that seeks alternative understandings of what many would consider commonplace. For example, the concept of scale or the need for a title. In typical David fashion, <coughs> excuse me, in typical David fashion, he has withheld his lecture title from me this evening in order to build, presumably, the suspense, or maybe, or maybe to get me to question the value of a title at all. So in lieu of sharing his lecture title with you, I will instead offer this lecture introduction entitled, A Lecture Introduction. No, no, even better, almost a lecture introduction. David is intelligent, inquisitive, and a design instigator. For those of you that have enjoyed conversations with David over the past nine months, including the students that have been lucky enough to have him, you may have noticed that those conversa conversations include a plethora of whys. He has a genuine interest to probe known territory with deep inquisition. The conversations contain hours of seeking the right word, or rather, battling around for the almost right word. An example. David inquires, what is round? My response, a wheel, a circle. No, I mean, David says, what is almost round? Me, your face, a tire, an orange. No, that's not quite it. Me, what is the point? These conversations continue with the objective withheld. But what I have learned is that the conversations seek to reveal problems that we will almost solve. It is within this almost realm where David finds productive ground. Mingling in this zone, he aims to generate innovative takes on old problems. This zone of inquiry is where David has dedicated his time as this year's 2014-2015 Howard Lefevre Emerging Practitioner Fellow here at the Knowlton School. His fellowship centers on questions of difference, scale, and representation in architecture, and it is in this area that I suspect we will learn a lot about tonight. For a little background, David holds a Bachelor of Architecture from Carnegie Mellon University and a Master of Architecture with Distinction from the Southern California Institute of Architecture. His thesis, entitled Paperweight, was awarded the Henry Adams Certificate. And prior to joining the KSA, he worked in the Los Angeles-based architecture office, First Office, and was teaching at SIARC. His work has been, has been exhibited in Los Angeles, and soon we will be able to add the KSA as part of that exhibition zone with his exhibition opening here on April 24th. His creative works have been published in Project Journal, Aggregate, 
and he recently presented at the ACSA annual conference with the paper Architecture's Digital Model Problem, beginning his lecture with a slide with the text that read The Full Scale Problem. You see, David is very interested in the problem of the problem. <laughs> or more specifically, the almost problems of architecture. He is included in a larger contingent of young designers that interrogate problems of architecture, such as part problems, digital problems, and even the problem of looking beyond the problem. It is a group that flourishes within the realm of nuance and calls for new forms of close reading. In closing, be prepared to almost solve problems as you are guaranteed to question things you thought were already solved. Please help me welcome David Eskenazi. Uh, hi, uh, that was like the way better <laughs> lecture than what I'm gonna do right now, so. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. Uh, I like that almost thing, I never really thought about that, so. Yeah, maybe that would be a good title, just titling it almost. But instead, um, I actually, I, like the, the question of the title was, uh, I didn't deliberately not tell you, I just wanted to, you know, I didn't want you to reveal it before I talked about it, but it's actually not that interesting, so uh, maybe, you, maybe it's not worth the building up of it. But I was thinking of um, basically, I, like I wasn't really sure what this lecture was really supposed to be about, so I tried to come up with different titles that would suggest different things about what I was supposed to do tonight. Um, and so these are them, uh, or like possibilities for titles. So the first one is the kind of boring, obvious one, which is probably the one I like the most, which is the Lefevre uh, Emerging Practitioner Fellowship uh, Lecture, um, which basically might suggest that uh, basically what I'm doing tonight is, is kind of reporting to you guys about what I've been up to this year, or sort of who I am, and sort of a summary uh, of what it is um, I'm supposed to be doing uh, this year. Uh, the second uh, title that I was thinking um, was uh, called On Digital Models, Scale, uh, Practicing to Practice and Teaching, um, which are basically the topics I'll go over tonight, which, uh, unlike the first title, might suggest something uh, with the possibility of things I'll continue to do uh, after the fellowship. Um, the third one, and this I owe to Alex uh, when we were late cutting cardboard late at night, uh, small things, big things, round things, round things. So you're definitely right about the rounds. Uh, and I think this is my favorite one because, uh, I don't know, it's you just uh, repeat round things, but basically those are the things that uh, I'm, I'm building in the gallery uh, are small, big, and round. Um, and the last one was just uh, kind of like some characters in order of their appearance in my lecture tonight. Um, pixels, knights, uh, scale figures, rulers, screws, Legos. Grids, maker bots, plus signs, Egyptian monuments, grids, stones, cardboard grids, wheels, and grids again. <laughs> uh, because I thought those things were uh, basically a collection of um, some things I'll sort of talk about. And my favorite thing about this is that you can just pick whichever one of these you like, and that's the lecture that I'll give to me. And the other ones, if you don't like them, I'm not giving that lecture. So it's up to you. <clears throat> what is this? Oh, OK. Um, all right, so this I want to start with this, with this image uh, that I took, um, this is a, a picture I took on my cell phone of my computer screen because uh, I wanted to send it to somebody, which in a certain way is like a new form of communication um, uh, that we might use in architecture and, and maybe has even more or less validity than a screenshot itself. Um, and the reason I like this picture is that it's, it's not very spectacular uh, in any way. Uh, there's nothing really all that special about it. Um, it's kind of, it's quite banal uh, and, and pretty, uh, not that interesting, and so that's what I like about it because we can just uh, not get too excited about what it looks like. But there's a few things about it that I thought were, were particularly useful to begin a lecture, uh, or my lecture tonight, um, because it sort of touches on a bunch of issues that I'm gonna go through uh, during the lecture today. So, uh, the first thing you might notice about it is that there's like that arrow, which cues us into the idea that this is sort of uh, something from a computer, and really this is, like I said, it's a picture of my own working space, the place that I work, which is, uh, in the digital kind of software. Um, and the second thing you might notice is this, is this like uh, person that's kind of standing there, uh, which uh, as you can tell is kind of a, a digital model of a person, it's sort of a rendering of that model, and it's not a very well built model either. It's got all these like gaps and seams in the, in the body. Um, but there's things about the image itself which cue us into the fact that this is about kind of a digital space. Um, and if we imagine for a second that the, that the person wasn't there, that there wasn't a scale figure uh, in front of this, we would really have no idea what we were looking at. It would just be a bunch of 
uh, colors and stuff on a sort of in a square, uh, kind of just this abstract thing. So this, the person sort of shows up, projects a shadow, and gives this thing a sense of scale. It kind of grounds it. It sort of implies that you know, this area of the image might actually be a ground, even though there's no color there. Um, it kind of shows up and does a, a bunch of work uh, all by itself. <clears throat> and so uh, one of the things that I, I like about this is that it, a lot like uh, my own work, uh, it's something that uh, kind of cues us into how the image was uh, constructed itself. Um, and so I, I really uh, wanted to sort of talk about how uh, the stuff I'll kind of present tonight um, really asks you to pay close attention to the things that are sort of below the surface of our working space or sort of especially our uh, contemporary working space, which let's say uh, we confront kind of digital models more and more these days. Um, and uh, uh, that's sort of where I'm going to kind of go with it. Another thing that I wanted to briefly mention is that I generally have an interest uh, between the intersection of design authorship and then the biases of these working spaces. So sort of this, inter this kind of tension between the things that we want to do and the things that uh, kind of our tools and our working spaces sort of bias us to do without us thinking, uh, for me as a general kind of attention is, is sort of a, an interest that I like to kind of make uh, explicit in my work. Um, so I wanted to quickly start, maybe some of you guys have seen me talk about this before. Um, uh, this is uh, two images from Aldo Rossi, uh, who uh, was a, a practicing architect. Uh, in you know the mid uh, 20th century to kind of uh, maybe late 80s or 90s, mid 90s, something like that. Um, uh, he, these two images are from two projects that he did. Uh, on the left is uh, the this thing that he called uh, the tea and coffee piazza. It's a tea set, uh, and on the right is um, his teapot tower. It's a tower. Uh, one is a drawing, one is a model, or actually a photograph of the actual thing. But what I like about them is that they both sort of suggest kind of a difference in sort of what's a model and what's a thing in itself. Um, so for example, the, the tea set, or the tea and coffee piazza, it looks, there's a lot of things about it that kind of make it seem like it kind of uh, could be a city, right? Like it has these like things that look like cities, like the pediment with the clock. Uh, there's sort of a collection of little objects that kind of remind us of many buildings put together. Um, and the building on the right, or the image on the right, uh, there's something about it which, uh, even though it looks like a teapot, cues us into the fact that it's a building, things like the fact that there's bricks and scale figures in it. Um, but what both of them sort of have this quality of is that they're in a thing inside, in it of themselves, a building or a tea set, um, but they also sort of have a quality about them that refers to something outside of themselves, right? To sort of uh, something at a different scale. Um, and so in a sense, you're not really sure which of these is the model of which one. It's possible that the piazza is a model of the, of the, t of the tower and the tower is a model of the piazza. Um, so these things kind of uh, begin to interest me and sort of developed uh, kind of thinking about Rossi, this idea and sort of an interest in myself and models, things that have qualities of models but are also kind of objects in themselves that we can kind of look at. And the other thing that I'm always usually interested in is not just models but drawings, uh, and especially drawings that I can kind of uh, uh, look at and use as a, as a model for my own work. Um, and so this is a drawing by uh, Claude Perrault, uh, done in the, let's say, late uh, 15th century. Um, where uh, uh, Perrault was asked to modernize and standardize um, the state architecture of France. Uh, and at the time, it was thought that we had to have these orders, right? We had to have sort of classical motifs in, in buildings to be called architecture. Uh, and what everybody was doing in sort of this famous battle with this other guy called Blondel uh, was looking back at history and looking back at, like, back at ancient ruins and trying to figure out what the ancient authority said was the actual uh, kind of proportions of these things. And everybody had their own ratios and their own proportions that they said were right. And what Perot did for the first time was he was like, doesn't really matter what happens. What matters is that uh, we can kind of just draw it really quickly and abstract it and, uh, and kind of uh, disperse it across France. Um, and so the way he does this is through a, a moment of abstraction where he averages everybody else's orders and then rounds it up to whole numbers and sticks it on a grid. Um, so basically, it doesn't matter that one is bigger than the other, it just matters that you just count them between them. Um, but really, in the end, the, the main point of this drawing, and, and what's important for me about it, is that uh, what Perot's saying is, is that it really doesn't matter what these things look like. All that matters is sort of the thinking behind them, that you can just add up to them, or you can just subtract from them, they get registered to a grid. Um, their actual aesthetics is sort of uh, not that significant to him. So the first project I'm going to uh, show you uh, was um, something that I was thinking about uh, this idea uh, where th what things uh, look like doesn't really matter, um, but that a drawing transformation and the change 
uh, in its aesthetics uh, can actually uh, begin to uh, look at these issues of the drawing and the model that I was interested in with Rossi and, um, and Perot. Uh, so this is a drawing of the Stanton chess set, uh, which is the canonical uh, chess set that is in use for like tournaments today. Um, it was developed in the, in the mid 19th century uh, as sort of a standard for British, uh, the British monarchy to sort of uh, design these things. And what I love about this thing is it's actually uh, uh, a toy, but it's also a model of architecture. Uh, so there's a lot of abstractions of, of architecture in it. Like all the bases are kind of abstractions of Doric columns or in Doric bases. Um, the rook looks like a turret. Uh, the knight, the, the horse, is, a, is actually an abstraction or a copy of the uh, horse of Selina, which is on the uh, east pediment of the Parthenon. So there's already all these things in here which we can begin to look at as both a chess set in front of us, but it's something that actually refers um, outside of itself, uh, which to me I thought was really interesting. So the first question that I asked myself was, um, how does an architect look at the chess set? So uh, the answer to that was they draw it first, and this is my drawing of the chess set, that's what you're looking at. Um, and what I became interested in were sort of the parts that the chess set has in common, that uh, every piece has a head, a stem, and a base. Um, and I became sort of interested in thinking about Perot, the fact that he could just change these things uh, kind of uh, without worrying about what these things look like. So the first thing that I did was that I just, um, <laughs> I just changed them all to the same height, uh, uh, which I think was pretty funny because um, now the pawn is really big and the king and queen are actually pretty diminutive and kind of look fragile. Um, they don't sort of have the same, already they don't have the same kind of proportional uh, authority over one another. Uh, and what I realized was that all the pieces that I was identifying, like the head, the stem, and the base, are able to change really easily just through an act of a, a drawing transformation. So I started to make uh, other chess sets uh, with this idea. Um, you can see there's like a really giant pawn and a really tiny pawn head, which I think is funny. Uh, but I was sort of interested in this idea that the, ch the chess pieces were always thought to have this uh, aesthetic to them that was kind of inert and, and really solid and stoic. And just by changing these little things, you could suddenly make them kind of funny or ugly or stupid, uh, like this guy, which is like my favorite one ever with this <laughs> giant face. Um, but it really didn't matter anymore what these things represented, it just mattered that you could kind of do a drawing transformation and, um, and change what these things uh, begin to look like. Look like. <clears throat> so I just kept making things, uh, I started making like new pieces just by combining different proportions of these things. Um, and again, like these things get really fat, they, they become asymmetrical now. Uh, they almost look like they could, like this one could like fall over and like roll around or something. Um, but basically the chess piece doesn't necessarily need to look like it's standing up anymore. It can kind of look off balance, uh, sort of changing its own uh, ideas of what is beautiful or, or what is not beautiful. <clears throat> so these are some more of those guys. Uh, I like this one because it doesn't even fit on the paper that I printed it on, uh, which I thought was like, even more interesting than even seeing what it's supposed to look like. Um, the other thing that I started doing was that if those drawings were looking at the pieces within a, a, or the parts within a piece, a chess piece, I was also interested in the idea that the, each chess piece is a part within the whole set. Um, so then I started making other drawings where I put all the pieces together, uh, not the not, I'm sorry, not, yeah, all the pieces together, not worrying about the parts of the pieces. Um, and I kind of attached them to this thing that I was uh, thinking of as like a proportional apparatus, this thing that can kind of go up and down and make like the middle uh, bigger or the top bigger. Uh, and I started to make these kind of new figures out of that uh, idea. And then I began to reimagine those figures as plans. Um, and so these are plans that begin to carry through, if you can see stuff, yeah, okay. uh, the annotation of their own making. Um, so there's things that begin to describe how everything was made, like there's this annotation of like curve, curvature counts uh, and construction of grids and proportions and all these things that sort of suggest this thing was constructed in a certain way. Uh, but then there's other things that make it sort of look like a plan, right? Like the wood of the, this kind of like wood grain texture or like a kind of column grid that's sort of in there. Um, but what's missing from these drawings is anything that might show us human scale, right? Like there's nothing like a door, there's no stairs, there's no uh, furniture, there's nothing that really tells us how wide anything is. So we're not really sure how big any of these things are, but what begins to happen, uh, and especially you can tell in these two drawings, is that certain things do change in scale, like the grid uh, in this one is a lot less dense than the grid in this one, for example, and we might start to understand that because of that, the drawing on the left is maybe a smaller plan than the one on the right. 
So um, for me, these drawings actually were super productive uh, in terms of like a space to think about uh, uh, new work that I was, I was interested in. Um, and you can kind of read more about this in this little fictional narrative I wrote about it uh, for Pigeon that'll get published in a month or in two weeks or something. Um, but it sort of led me to a lot of other ideas, and this is something that uh, I, I've been thinking a lot about, which I've, I'm, uh, again, I think Christy did a better job explaining this than I'm going to, but the idea of problems in architecture is not an idea that I had, but it's sort of a, an old thing, an idea in architecture, the problems like the nine square problem or the four square problem kind of uh, arrange people together around uh, certain ideas. Um, and I was invited to, to participate in this conference at ACSA, it's part of a panel um, hosted by Aaron Bessler and Sarah Hearn about uh, problems in architecture, which I think Christy was referring to. Um, and I was thinking about digital models and certain qualities about digital models that I don't think um, are negative things uh, about, uh, about them, but sort of add new wrinkles to the way that we work. Um, and so in particular, uh, these are four general ones that I can think of a lot more, but these are the four that I'm gonna sort of uh, talk about uh, today. But I, I wanted to say that, the, like I said, the problem for me is not a negative thing. It's more of thinking about Alberti's paradigm, uh, which is that architects don't make their buildings. They make representations of buildings and somebody else goes and, and, and makes the building, which I'm a big fan of. And I, I have to tell you, building and installation is not my <laughs> like thing that I love to do, but I'm, I'm excited about it. But I do, I do sort of, uh, we can all kind of agree or not agree uh, as to whether we were in interested in Alberti, but I am interested in that paradigm that architects only make representations. And so for me, these problems begin to add kind of new wrinkles to, to that idea that we don't make those representations. Um, so I'll briefly describe them. This is, so the first one is the full scale problem, um, which has to do with the problem of simulation rather than iteratively scaled uh, working spaces that we might work in. This is the one I'll probably work, talk about the most uh, in the rest of the lecture, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about it. Uh, another one was the standard problem, uh, which I'll read these two quotes really quick. They come from uh, the uh, opening remarks of the 2000 edition of Architectural Graphic Standards, which is like a, a standard book in every architecture office for how to make drawings. Um, so the first quote is by Robert Ivey, who was the editor-in-chief of Architectural Record at the time. Uh, the potential unlocked by the computer age only underscores our need for a resource like graphic standards. When all things are possible, we need to know what things are best. Uh, he's, he's, he doesn't like the computer. When you want to know what, what's like the best things, we don't have any standards. Philip Johnson, <laughs> writing in the exact same, the next page, uh, makes this amazing quote, uh, which I thought was really funny. Uh, I don't even understand that it is in digital form on CD ROM <laughs> located in the back cover of this book. Uh, what's next? The Graphic Standards website. So this is in like the year 2000 by Philip Johnson, who was like 150 uh, at the time. Um, and it's funny because there's still no website for Graphic Standards. There's a website that you can go and buy the book, but there is no open source uh, a website that sort of allows us to understand architectural standards in the digital space, but there are websites like Google Warehouse or TurboSquid where you can download any digital model that kind of exists out there. Um, and so to me, what's interesting about this, about this problem is just the, the idea that there aren't these standards in architecture and we don't have conventions like we do in, in drawing uh, for, for how to model something in a computer. Uh, another problem that I became interested in um, was this uh, thing I'm calling the problem of doubled reverse directionality. Reverse directionality is actually a, quote, a term that Robin Evans uh, puts forward in, this, in his famous essay, um, Translations from Drawing to Building, um, where he looks at uh, Schinkel's painting, The Origin of Painting, which was a painting based on um, Pliny the Elder's uh, story about the origin of painting that was basically a subject that a lot of painters for a long time would paint. But what he points out is that the difference between Schinkel, who's an architect, and everybody else, is that um, Schinkel draws uh, the shadows, right? Whereas everybody else is drawing what they see uh, out there in nature. And what, so he terms this, uh, this term, reverse directionality, uh, to say that, the, that drawings have this quality about them, that a drawing can be about something that you project in the future, and that's how architects use drawings, but drawing can also be uh, the opposite, which is what painters do, according to him, uh, which is that they draw what they see, what's already out in reality. 
Um, what I became interested in was the idea that digital models kind of occur before drawing uh, and after drawing. And so uh, I became interested in this idea that when we look at drawings, we might look at something that projects into the future, like a building, but we also might look at a drawing and kind of read um, like a trace of the digital model that it came from. That it, there's sort of like these doubling loops about them. Anyway, I just like kind of mirroring the text on the slide. Uh, another one, and this is sort of the last one I'll go into, is the problem of solidity through surface, that in digital models, everything is an infinitely thin plane that has no thickness, and things that represent uh, material are actually empty. Um, and so, uh, for me, these are sort of all problems that I became aware of and became interested in. Uh, this one I'll, I'll describe in a little bit more detail right now. Uh, so these are, there's going to be a lot of this, like, drawings you can't quite see to me because of the projector, so I apologize, but um, I became interested in this problem of, of uh, the solidity through surface and how to draw that space inside of a digital model which should be solid in reality. So I drew uh, the Lego um, because I think Legos are funny and uh, banal, like I've, I've been saying. Um, and I started making these uh, kind of axonometric uh, drawings and renderings and, and basically asking like how do we draw uh, the space inside of the Lego, or how do we render that space? Um, then sort of asking more questions, how do we build a model of a Lego, of the inside of that Lego space? Or how do, do we do it through kind of a solid model, like on the left, or do we do it by unrolling all the surfaces and making a paper model? Like what would, what would actually make sense kind of conceptually? That became kind of an interesting thing, and it, what it did was it led to a workshop that I did in the fall with a bunch of you guys. So you'll remember this, um, which was called the, an actual stuff workshop, um, which I think, I don't want you guys to tell me because I don't remember, but I think the term actual stuff, we were in studio one day in the fall, and one of you guys asked me the question after a lecture, so does she like do actual stuff after somebody's lecture? And I thought that that was like great because I was like, what, who defines what actual stuff is? Um, and digital models have no actual stuff, so I thought that was a good title for a workshop. I don't really remember who said it, but I know it was one of you guys. Um, so, the, so basically the, the workshop, what we were interested in doing was how to draw that space, just like those Legos. Uh, so we looked at, um, at uh, Magritte's painting, The Secret Double, where he kind of uh, has a model for how to draw the outside and the inside of something at the same time. Um, and then I asked the students to basically make drawings of, of the chess set, because, you know, that's something I was already interested in. Uh, and this is, a, in particular, a, a digital model of a plastic-formed uh, chest set, so they're actually kind of hollow, but they have a very thin sort of material thickness. Um, so these are just some, some, some work from that workshop, uh, 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 where first we began to ask, how do you render that space inside of the, inside of the digital model? Um, so these are some of those maybe washed out from the projector drawings and renderings. Can you see these? Kind of. I had to like totally manipulate these so that they would you could see them on the projector. So I'm sorry, but um, one thing that the other thing we decided to do was be using axonometric kind of unfolds, uh, began to annotate through line drawings and sort of uh, a bunch of uh, uh, kind of marks how this thing gets put together and what that's what's the quality of the space inside of a digital model that is actually supposed to be solid and isn't really real space at all. Um, while on the subject of teaching, I thought I'd just show some work from uh, the studio in the fall. Uh, and just um, just from one project, which was this house project, where we asked these guys to uh, uh, learn software. <laughs> uh, so I thought it was sort of apt to show tonight. Um, and basically, the way that we did that is, I was interested in at making sure that these, that we could kind of teach software in a way we would calibrate plan and section, which is really obvious. <laughs> um, so the <laughs> I forgot about the egg. Um, so the, the, what I asked these guys to do, like it should be obvious, right? Borini plus an egg equals a house. Uh, what I asked these guys to do is to think through the problem of Borini's conoid, uh, which is on the left there, where he was sort of interested in the idea where if you had like a square and a triangle and a circle, what kind of form would that make if those were elevations and plans? Um, and so this is way before computers. He figures out how to draw this, uh, this, this object that's out here, um, which, uh, which is called Groenis conoid, and then I asked the students to sort of find uh, an object that they that had like a strong silhouette and also had a hole in it. Um, this was my one of my examples, which was a sunny side up egg. Um, and so they started uh, producing these really beautiful uh, kind of figure grounds. Um, we had a lot of keys last semester, uh, but then um, Chris also found the Ohio State logo, which I, 
<laughs> first I freaked out, but I sort of was like, okay, but you did a good question. So, um, <clears throat> wait, I'm a little bit ahead of myself here. Okay. Uh, so this is some of their work and just some random projects, but I think they're sort of good examples of just uh, looking at how, basically what I asked them to do is figure out a way that you could have a plan that looked like an axiometric and, a, and an axiometric that would look like a plan. Um, as a way to sort of learn uh, digital space. Uh, so, you know, like Shelby put the stairs inside of the laundry detergent handle, which I thought was really funny. Um, these guys worked on the four scale, the, the nine square problem and the four square problem. This is that the Ohio State logo as a building, <laughs> which turned out way better than the logo. So that, I thought that was good. Um, Okay, so now I'm going to talk about scale in a lot more depth, uh, which will basically be like the rest of the lecture. Um, so this is like a really uh, weird photograph that I think is uh, pretty interesting. Um, it was one of the first photographs taken of the Egyptian monuments uh, by this guy, Maxime Ducamp, who was a, uh, like just a reporter that the French government sent to Egypt, and they were like, go take pictures. Um, and what he sort of ran into was this problem of how to photograph these things while communicating to everybody back at home how big they were, because nobody really knew how big the Egyptian monuments were, like at least on a sort of a visceral level. So what he does in all the photos is include a, a human scale figure. Uh, the reason I picked this one in particular is because it's hilarious, because the guy uh, is sitting just like on top of the, of the sphinx. Um, and for one reason or another, that had to do with all sorts of uh, maybe, like, let's say, racial issues. The guy's wearing a hood at the time because um, he thinks that the camera is a, is a gun uh, because that's what uh, the guy told him. Anyway, what's interesting to me about it is that um, uh, if we look at it, uh, we could sort of kind of read the, the photograph in a couple ways. Um, the first is that neither the sphinx nor the person is a full body. And in fact, what's missing of the person is what's visible of the sphinx. Um, and in a certain way, it's like the head of the guy like got scaled up and put below him, uh, which I think is funny. So they're sort of like a bisected hole uh, together. And the other thing that you'll notice is that um, the, the guy, the person, and the eyes of the sphinx are the same distance from the center of the image. And both of these things begin to suggest that neither of them are the sole subject of the photograph. They're both kind of the subject of this picture. And what I like about that is that it really puts to, puts to the forefront the, the problem of representation of scale uh, in any, or the problem of scale in any representation. Um, that this isn't just a problem of uh, contemporary architecture, but this is an old problem of how to tell how big things are in any form of representation. Um, uh, and I think this, I just like this picture. So uh, one thing that I've been thinking about in terms of how to sort of classify uh, those things uh, in terms of scale devices is I sort of came up with three categories. The first would be comparison, which is basically what that picture was or what, let's say, um, scale figures do as they sort of allow something recognizable to be compared to something that's new or something unknown. Um, so in these two pictures on the left, you can see the two spheres. The reason we know they're different sizes is because the screw uh, changes in size, the grid in the background changes in scale, and the ruler uh, seems to get closer to us. So there's all these other things that's being compared to uh, that sort of indicate that this, is, this one on the bottom is actually uh, a lot smaller uh, than the one on the top. The thing that we've done as architects that is really successful is we took uh, kind of a convention and ascribed it to white abstract pieces of paper. Uh, and those are any kind of convention, but the idea of scale drawings, let's say, um, things like eight scale or quarter scale, or in this case, uh, graphic scale, that begins to tell us that things on one piece of paper are not the same scale as something else. Um, and what I'm interested in, and this is the kind of full scale problem that I was referring to before, is that in digital models, there's nothing that tells us um, how big anything is. Uh, in fact, um, uh, central to the digital model is its virtual uh, full-scale environment, which is a clear contrast to manually drafted iteratively scaled drawings. So in a digital model, things are simulated at their actual size from the start without an incremental change of scale that would abstract uh, construction detail from overall organizations. These are things that you work on at the same time in a digital model, uh, which I think is sort of uh, both problematic but also kind of interesting, in, at least in my own work. Um, and so basically, uh, representation always requires some kind of scale device, whether it's a comparative device, a conventional device, or some form of display device, to give us an idea of how big something is. So, um, yeah, I did my best with the Photoshopping for the drawings, but just imagine nice, beautiful drawings at the top there. Uh, uh, so first I want to talk about the thesis that I did at, at SciArt, um, and I worked for with uh, my advisor, who's on Anymar. Um, 
it was called Paperweight, like uh, Christy said before. Um, and what I like about the title Paperweight is that it's, uh, it's kind of like Rossi's models, uh, in that a paperweight is both a thing in front of us, like a literal stupid thing that doesn't do anything, um, but if you think about the, the term paperweight and sort of separate the two words out, uh, the weight of paper in architecture uh, could be kind of metaphorical for representation kind of imprinting itself into a building. Um, and so I sort of like the kind of double reading of the title that you could sort of think about it uh, like a model, uh, something that's in front of you and something that projects um, outside of itself. Um, so uh, the drawings that you can't see <laughs> uh, that are up there, uh, you, you know, that's, you should be able to see them, but you can just imagine this in your head. They're basically, you start to carry through, just like the chess plans, um, uh, kind of annotation from their construction, things like curvature changes and elevation marks and proportional ratios, grids, all these things that give kind of scaled incremental parts to, to these objects. And then at the bottom here, uh, these are photographs of some of these paperweights. And what I like about them is that uh, they start to give you a different sense of scale of how big these things are just through the pixelization and the resolution of the image and through um, a grid that's actually in the background uh, behind the object itself. Um, as I kept working on this, I started to ask myself uh, not just how to do an elevation or how to do kind of construction work, um, but also how to draw other forms of normal architectural representation. So these are plans of those paperweights. And the way that I thought about the plan of the paperweight was because uh, the paperweight was a 3D print. It was an object in front of us. I was always interested in every form of representation of thinking how that thing that forms the representation uh, kind of uh, gives that thing scale, how that thing sort of inscribes itself. So because those things are 3D printed with a MakerBot, uh, I, I like the idea that MakerBots, as you guys probably know, um, basically works through layering plans on top of one another and that literally draws it with like a, an extruded hot filament. So it's basically just drawing stuff and then like putting those on top of each other. So it's things through plan. Um, so this is what the MakerBot is basically doing. It was sort of putting in all the support structure, which were grids. Uh, at different scales, which again, these are a little bit washed out, but you can kind of imagine. And I thought they were really beautiful. Um, and you could almost kind of imagine some of these as plans of cities, of things that are much bigger than themselves, but uh, really these are just tiny little objects uh, in and of themselves. <clears throat> and so the next thing that I became kind of interested in is how to sort of draw, uh, ooh. Ooh, okay. uh, how to draw those uh, plans. I was very lucky because I tried very hard to kind of export the file from the MakerBot to actually draw it, but I couldn't. So I had to do the same thing as the chess sets, which was to ask myself, how do you draw something um, that you can't, don't actually have a file of in your computer? So uh, uh, these were my drawings of those things that you just saw. And then I started to add a lot of other things like the figure of the grid, the proportional ratios of how these paperweights were constructed, um, center points, regulating arcs, and all these other things that sort of go into, into how to put a drawing together. Um, and what ended up happening is as I worked on them, I started to think of these things as actually imprinting themselves into act, becoming like actual material things in a building. Um, so uh, these are different scales of drawings, but the reason that we might sort of begin to see that is the difference in the sizes of the grids that we're looking at. So the screws, for example, in this one are actually at the size of a screw, but the screws, the things that look like screws in this one are now the size of uh, a, a room, for example. Um, there's all sorts of other things like that that sort of uh, occur at different scales, or sometimes don't change in scale in relationship to the drawing, but kind of become different things, sort of a a ridiculous but imaginative way, let's say. And the next thing that I did was I started to build models, Ooh, okay, uh, kind of zooming into these drawings and imagining what a detail would be. So if we were working kind of at a scale that was really big, I wanted to go really small and make, uh, try to figure out how would you would imagine the same thing. And so the same thing is kind of happening in these models, which is to begin to think about things that might change in representation and things that might not. Um, so the thing that you can uh, uh, begin to see are things like the figure of the grid starts to get denser and denser, sort of uh, allowing us the idea that one is bigger than the other. There's things like the Lego, again, sort of makes an appearance and appears at different scales. But then there's things that don't change, uh, like these, the counts of these circles. There's always four circles. The lines are always divided the same way. So there's certain things that are about kind of the size of the object of these models. And then there's certain things about the kind of project forward um, about what this thing might be as architecture. Uh, these are, again, photographs of, of two of those models, but you can start to see uh, how these screws might read as normal size screws, but this one becomes much more volumetric and the, because of the scale of the grid changes, things sort of seem like they might be a completely different scale now. So 
that was all things from my thesis a long time ago. I'm going to sort of now talk about some of the stuff that where these ideas are going, especially towards this installation in two weeks. Um, and for me, uh, those uh, drawings were always about the problem of representation, but never really confining the problem of size, of actually seeing these at different sizes. So the gallery installation is about the opposite. It's really about confining the, the problem of different sizes, all with the same scale of stuff. Um, and so uh, the way that I've been sort of imagining this is uh, beginning to sort of conceptualize, um, again, the problem of size through representation itself. Uh, so, for example, just beginning to think about how a scale figure begins to suggest uh, just different ideas of how big uh, something is. Um, so the, you can see that's the biggest one that is going to go in the gallery. It's a big one. <laughs> um, uh, but really what I needed to do to figure out how to design these things is I needed a, a, a model from a drawing, uh, just like uh, before. So I looked at this drawing from Piranesi, which I think you can kind of see. Um, uh, this is sort of uh, one of his drawings from the fragments of the Severin Marble Plan. Um, Piranesi in this drawing, he's sort of representing the past as a myth. He's looking at ancient Rome and reimagining what the plan is, but rather than try to tell you what the truth of it is, he's literally just saying you don't really know. It's kind of a bunch of this stuff. And so he draws it in these kind of uh, what looks like stones. What I like about this drawing in particular is that all the stones are actually drawn at different scales. So uh, the drawing on this stone is a much bigger scale, for example, than like the drawing on like this stone or the drawing on this stone. They kind of zoom in and out. Uh, so for me, I thought this was like a good model for myself of how to uh, make different sizes of, this, of things because all these uh, stones are different sizes. And famously, what he, the other thing that he does is that um, there's no line weights in these drawings. It's all single line uh, kind of uh, work. So there's no kind of representation of material thickness in this drawing. There's nothing that tells us how thick walls are. It's just kind of center lines. Um, so in a way, it kind of prefigures the problem that we have right now in digital, in digital models. Um, so I made this drawing, which was like my version of, uh, of what Piranesi was doing. But what I was thinking is that mine is actually the opposite. Um, rather than reimagine the past, I'm using a drawing to kind of project forward into a building in the future. Or well, not a building, but an installation, I guess. Um, uh, whereas Piranesi had different scales on all of his, uh, his little stones, mine are all actually at the same scale. Um, and so there's sort of a reversal in the problem of scale to the problem of size from what I, the work I was doing before. Um, so some of the things that you can see, uh, like this is a zoom in of that drawing, um, is that the grid begins to change in line weight, right? Like these things start to get a lot thicker, this like grid that goes on them. Uh, but we can also see another grid, which is, I don't know if you can see it, but it's right here, which doesn't change at all, sort of overlays itself on the whole thing. Um, uh, and uh, there's other things like line weights and line types that begin to change in scale and give all of these pieces different ideas of how big they might be uh, in a representation of themselves. The other thing that I uh, sort of was interested in is screenshots, uh, just like the first image I showed you. Um, so in these two kind of, again, very banal screenshots, I think they're really beautiful. Like I like the purple and the red and whatever, but uh, we can start to see the pixels. And again, one of them is sort of at a different scale than the other. And this I thought was sort of uh, really uh, similar to some drawings I've been working on a while ago. Uh, uh, kind of about sort of the scale of rendering and pixelization. Some of you guys I think have seen these before. Uh, where I was looking at the funnies, fuzziness of the render as a form of scale. So like this one's pretty clear uh, as to what we look at, but this one gets really, really fuzzy just through the scale of the things that make up the drawing um, and kind of uh, make it really different. So I thought these were sort of uh, beautiful um, rendered plans. So. The other thing I began to think about was how a line weight on something small increases or decreases on something large. Uh, what the scale referent of that thing is. Um, when scaling up, what are the new issues? How, do we, how does the material itself annotate itself? Uh, how does a drawing, a new type of drawing or rendering like this drawing begin to sort of annotate scale? So you start to see things like a grid or a bounding box, a size comparison. But all those sort of issues I was interested in about comparison, convention, and display, the sort of uh, scale devices, begin to make an appearance and sort of marking and imprinting themselves into, into the work that I'm doing. Um, yeah, okay. So this is a drawing that begins to um, look at how to make a lot of these. This is actually a worm's eye of the gallery. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of like this drawing because all those people, that's you guys lining up to get in and, <laughs> and not fitting in there, and kind of like an army. Um, 
So as many of these, guys, of these pieces or of these wheels are collected and stored in the gallery, um, they lean on the walls, they'll lean on against each other, uh, they leave just a small amount of space, small amount of space for people to walk around. Uh, they're bigger, all of them are bigger than people. Um, so one thing that I want to like, mention at this point is that I'm much more interested in the question of how than the question of what. Um, although what uh, is important to me as a designer, meaning what does it look like, what do I call it, uh, what are its qualities, uh, those things are important to me as someone that's just interested in designing things. I think for me the issue of how interests me more, which I don't know, Christy said why, that I like to ask why, I, I didn't realize I did, I, always, I thought I asked how, but I guess not. Um, I don't really know. Uh, but the question of how for me has a lot more to do with abstraction and questions of how something is done, uh, how it's conceptualized or how it's materialized. So one of the things I've been uh, thinking about a lot um, with the fellowship is practice. Uh, as you guys know, the fellowship's title is called the Emerging Practitioner uh, Fellowship. And so I thought it was important to begin to conceptualize practice uh, uh, through the issues of scale itself. Um, so this installation is really interested in conceptualizing how to actually scale something up. Uh, and it sort of does this very, very literally and contextually. It basically suggests that to answer the questions of what this thing looks like or what form it takes, first you have to think through problems of how. Uh, how to scale up uh, literally into a gallery. Um, so, uh, for example, to uh, ask myself uh, how big should these things be, I just asked, um, well, how big can I make them? So I scaled them to the size of the gallery. Uh, I asked myself, what do I make it out of? And I, uh, uh, thanks to the help of Mike Cadwell and to Steve Turk for how to figure this out, um, I ended up just scaling it to the budget that you guys gave me. So I said, uh, how much cheap stuff can I buy? And this is how much. Um, I, but then I asked myself, how many should there be? And I, scheduled, I scaled to my schedule, which is two weeks to set up in the gallery. So that's how many we can get done according to how long it seems like we can, it takes to build one of these things. Um, and so really, I think that the question of scaling up is you know, obviously the general problem of practice, that as things get bigger uh, and move away from something in an office or something at a desk or something in a computer, like a drawing or a model, um, many new issues begin to pop up uh, that don't exist at smaller scales. Uh, issues like a site, a budget, uh, a schedule, labor, uh, material logistics, in case you haven't seen all the cardboard laying around the building, uh, material logistics are a big part of it, uh, structure, uh, broader audiences than what you do at a desk. Um, all of these things are normal things that everybody in practice kind of takes for granted and is very familiar with, but in this installation, uh, I'm really trying to, to sort of say uh, I'm going to maximize all those things and make those things obvious and apparent in the work itself. Um, so for me, the installation is a first step in conceptualizing some of these aspects of uh, practice. Um, this, but this doesn't really release me from the, from the problem of qualities, uh, because I think as a designer you're constantly confronting the intention of quality. So I would say that I'm very interested in the sort of um, kind of disheveled organization of the wheels, their lean, uh, their annotation as ornament, uh, the ornaments reference to maybe Viennese or conceptual practices of the past. Um, the cardboard's beauty and its reference maybe to cardboard architecture, uh, the shapes reference to pieces of a shaft of a column, or even to the organization's kind of staging of, as like a large ruin that we might kind of go inside of. Um, obviously these are all very intentional things, but for me the issue of authorship or the question of what something is uh, uh, begins to rub up against the issues of abstraction inherent what I'm doing, which has to do with the problem of how to do something. Um, so I don't think that those are really resolved yet in my work, but it's something that I'm continuing to work on. But this coexistence between an architect's desire of what they like to do versus uh, kind of um, how to get that thing done or sort of their intellect in terms of the problems of a working space or the problems that you're constantly confronting, for me, are, are really interesting. Um, and, you know, hopefully something that is going to continue in my work after the fellowship. Um, so you guys have probably seen this thing sitting outside my office that I built with Alex. Um, this is a mock-up uh, of one of these wheels. This is a medium-sized wheel, so uh, a lot of them are bigger and a lot of them are smaller. Um, uh, uh, it's made out of cardboard, uh, as obviously, again, you probably know. Um, and what I like about cardboard is that, like my earlier work, um, cardboard is made out of paper. Uh, and so I like the fact that paper begins to sort of uh, play with uh, kind of representational, representational associations. The way we build this thing is with tape and hot glue. It's still like a giant model uh, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, and so, but then there's sort of things about the cardboard itself that are going to begin to annotate this thing. So, uh, for example, just like the taping, this is tape. 
Uh, that will be just like that drawing I showed earlier, starts exchanging its line weight or its thickness uh, on different ones. Uh, new figures are going to pop up into this thing and, and begin to sort of annotate uh, its own construction uh, through how it was made. Um, so I wanted to show just some images of what it's like to what it's been like to do this. This is um, kind of the staging area just to build that thing outside my office. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of stuff that you got to do uh, when you scale things up. Um, there's a lot of parts. There's all these cubes. There's the big circle on the floor. Uh, and there's all these like pieces around. Uh, you need a lot of tape. You need a lot of hot glue. And um, there's always things that you run out of. Um, and I owe Alex credit for noticing this. But as we were building it, um, what we realized is that uh, <laughs> uh, at first it looks like a big model of Corb's uh, uh, city for three million inhabitants. <laughs> Um, and then as you keep working on it and you fill in the structure in between these pieces, it actually just looks like a big model of just one of them, which again, thanks Alex, because that was, that was a, I thought it was interesting, just the construction actually begins to play with the same problem. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> so, um, this is a good picture of some of people having fun. Um, this is, this is like my gratuitous picture that you know, sometimes you see in lectures like this of students embarrassing themselves while helping me do what I need to do. Um, so this is that, but this is also sort of the point where I want to invite everybody, uh, students and faculty, are welcome to, in the next two weeks to help me out kind of make this thing. Um, and like any good uh, kind of emerging practitioner, I'll repay you. Um, and so the way that I was thinking of repaying everybody was through with, um, so at least for students, um, was uh, food that comes in um, near circle shapes, so like a cookie, <laughs> or the waffle, which looks like a city, uh, or rice cake, or pizza, which is kind of probably going to be the most obvious one, uh, or a bagel, or really my favorite, which is the pizza bagel, which is actually a tiny pizza, so it's like a miniature version uh, of the pizza. Um, Last thing I want to do is to show you guys just a little bit of work from, from my current studio, which these guys are here, so it's a little bit awkward, but whatever. Um, uh, this is just um, just some couple of projects. These are not necessarily the best projects or the worst projects or anything. These are just the best that I can like, lay out quickly. Um, uh, just some work from the midterm, where basically our studio this semester, it's a topic studio, so it's very closely related to what I've been interested in, and we've been sort of curious as to how to work on the how to actually design a building, unlike what I've been doing, which is kind of abstract, uh, which has sort of a bunch of ambiguous scale relationships, so it's called architecture not to scale. Um, and so this is, uh, this is uh, uh, Tyler's project. Um, but basically what, uh, again, this is just from the midterm, so at this point what the students were beginning to think about was how um, to produce uh, ambiguities in scale through four methods. The first being through the organization of parts and holes. Um, so for, for example, the parts being rooms, uh, and maybe holes being masses or figures, how those things begin to relate to one another. Um, other things like the uh, ambiguities of ornamentation, things like the size of doors or windows or stairs, things that sort of make things maybe confusing in representation. Um, issues of uh, construction and, and lastly, like I said, representation. Um, so uh, basically all these things have sort of uh, been kind of we've been thinking about and thinking particularly about uh, Venturi, uh, who maybe uh, did this famously in his house for his mother, um, about sort of out of scale things. But for us, it's been much more through the, through the issues of abstraction in representation than through, let's say, uh, iconic, iconographic um, work like Venturi was doing. So this is Joe's project. Uh, let's see, this is Hannah's project. And now what the students are doing uh, for the final is actually they're gonna develop these as like techniques. Can you see them? No, doesn't matter. Um, so you could, well, it doesn't matter, but you can, they're developing these as techniques for producing a small building, a medium building, and a large building, uh, where they won't be ambiguously sized anymore. We'll know for sure how big they are. They'll have normal sized windows and doors and stuff like that. Um, but within them, they're sort of producing their own kind of techniques for how to produce um, ambiguities and scale uh, in the work that they're in these three buildings. Um, so our final review for this will be on April 24th, which is the same day as my opening in the gallery. So I hope you come see both things. Um, and I just wanted to end by just thanking uh, the school for this opportunity this year. It's been, um, it's been really amazing to just, I think, like, few people get uh, any moment of freedom in their lives to just do whatever they want for a while. So uh, I feel very lucky to have had that this year. So I wanted to thank the school for having me and the faculty for being really supportive and um, to the students for, like, dealing with whatever we've been doing together. Um, and to Alex Mann, my GA, who's been really awesome. So thanks, everybody.
so yeah, I'll take uh, some questions. I guess that's like a thing that we do. If you have any. Yeah, I think you know. I think that's a, a good question. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, Jacqueline was asking uh, uh, whether or not I'll make drawings or bring the actual thing back into the digital space. Um, I don't know because uh, first I want to make it, and I kind of wish like I was giving this lecture after it was done. You know, that would be awesome. But uh, but the it's a, sort of a good problem because I kind of have to represent it before it's even there. Um, but I think you know the one thing that we going to do is photograph the hell out of it. Uh, and so I'm really interested in what the, what the relationship of those photographs are going to be and how we photograph something like this to, to play up uh, actual ideas of size versus sort of ambiguous ideas of size. Um, so I don't know in terms of a digital model or drawings, but I think it would actually have a lot more to do with the photography of the thing itself. Um, and I'm, that's sort of like the next project once it's built to figure out how to do something like that I think would be really interesting. Yeah. In the beginning, you just started referencing the kind of role of graphic standards. And so I'm just kind of curious about what you have found in this process to either understand something about the difference between scale versus size. Because I think of like graphic standards as a place where students go to find out how big things are. Right. What's the literal size there versus scale? As we talk about it in this instance, the relationship to human proportion or one object to another, one comparative thing. And so I'm just curious if, there's a, if that's any part of the, the struggle that you yeah, well, I think like that's actually it's a good question. Like the problem of actual size stuff. Um, so Jason was asking about the relationship between sort of graphic standards as something which is not just a standard, but sort of helps us put actual, you know, like to go to to make things at the right size, like to have actual size objects. Whereas everything scale is maybe about proportions and parts. Um, uh, that it, in my own work, I, I think like actual sized things is something I haven't really confronted, obviously, uh, or it's sort of the representation of like pixels in Legos, but playing those up at different sizes and making a giant Lego or making a tiny Lego. Um, this, that's actually an idea that I've been really interested in, sort of how we play out the studio this semester uh, in terms of actually confronting real sized things and what, how that actually uh, how do you do ambiguous scale when you still have to have a normal door, right? Or, or whatever it is. Um, so in terms of my own work, I, that's, I've sort of used the studio as like a question mark as to like the next step for what I would want to do. Um, uh, and sort of testing out different ways that you know, each student kind of finds a different trajectory for how to work on that. But my interest in the graphic standards was more to say that when, you know, in digital models, if it is a space of representation with no scale, it's now simulation rather than kind of a, a, a scale that won't change within itself, you know, like a drawing. Um, uh, was just to point out that we don't have conventions in that space, and maybe we don't need conventions or standards in that space. But for me, that, that, that difference between one which has standards and recognizable ways of drawing things, and one which doesn't have standard <coughs> ways of, of doing things, I think that tension is really interesting to me, because we can uh, kind of play up those differences between the things that we all share of uh, sort of how to make something abstract concrete, which is what graphic standards, I think, does. Um, versus something which is abs abstract or not, we could argue, but like digital model space, which has no real size, uh, which kind of exists all over the place. Um, I think those sort of the tension back and forth to me, I think, is just a productive place for me to, to make stuff, I would say. Um. Two questions. One is, um, the screws look like jacks. Is that a side thing? No, they're, they're little screws. I went to the McMaster Car website and downloaded screws and just stick them, stuck them in. The second thing is, I've uh, uh, seen your circle upstairs. Yeah. Uh, are you, how are you going to get it in the room? That's just a mock-up. So that's just hanging out there. I see. 
Yeah, the, no, what I like about this is that it's like a ship in a bottle. We have to build them in the gallery. They don't fit through the door. Uh, it's both like hilarious and a huge nightmare. Um, so we have to build them all in the next two weeks, uh, which is why I'm offering pizza and cookies and, and round shaped things as food, because I need some help doing it. But um, no, I, we could try. We can make a video of trying to push it into the door and not, not going in. I've seen that slot, yeah. It won't fit through there. <laughs> we thought about, Doug, Doug pointed the slot out to me a while ago, and uh, we thought about the slot of space, but it didn't work. We'll see. We'll see if you can fit through the door. I don't know what to say. Maybe you can. Yeah. Just to, uh, the space between them is occupiable. You know, Stephen Turk did these amazing wheels, uh, like a, like a, like a, what is it? What's the guy? Vitruvius, yeah. The Vitruvius wheels that were actually built. So I thought because Steve had done occupiable wheels, I should make inoccupiable ones, you know? Just make something, do something a little bit different. Yeah. The inside the inflatable. Yeah, inflatable. I've been interested in inflatables, but we didn't really get to it. So, but I, that would be that would be fun. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. I really appreciate it.